All right. Um, thank you all um, so much for being here. My name is Amy Hesse, class of 2003. Uh, I am assistant director of alumni engagement um, at the college, and I'm really excited to have everyone here tonight. Um, we've got a wonderful panel, a wonderful group of alumni, and I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. Um, so um, I'm going to repeat myself again for those who just arrived. Um, so etiquette for this Zoom, please keep yourselves muted if you're not talking. Um, and if you don't want to appear on camera, um, please turn off your camera now. You, you can certainly appear on camera. Um, we are recording and we will uh, post this on the college website later on. Um, so the format for this 90 minute event, we'll spend about 10 minutes uh, for panelist introductions, then we'll spend 55 minutes or so um, with our moderator asking questions of our panelists, and then 20 minutes of open Q&A uh, from the audience, from you. So feel free to add your questions to the Zoom chat bar um, as they come up, but we will be saving those until later. Don't worry, we will be capturing them and uh, making sure they're all accounted for. We will try to get around to all of your questions as well as we can. Um, and uh, you can also raise your hand when we get to the open Q&A section towards the end. Um, so either way, you can ask your questions of the panelists. So um, I wanna mention, um, we, uh, as the Reed Career Alliance, um, have this wonderful series of career pathways uh, panels with all these alumni. Um, we don't uh, we don't overlap that much with what the Center for Life Beyond Reed does in terms of supporting you for careers in healthcare and medicine. And I want to make sure that I mention um, the that they are available to you um, for students, recent grads, and any alumni interested in going into medical school or healthcare. Um, there are two formal sources of advising. There's the pre-health faculty advisors, um, numerous faculty um, at Reed who are in a variety of fields who can support you in advising in that area. And then there's pre-med uh, Center for Life Beyond Reed advisors, currently Jerry Janowski, class of 76, and Presence O'Neill. Um, you can access um, or you can reach out to them through Handshake in order to set up an appointment to have a virtual appointment. Um, so um, those uh, make sure that you know you're taking adv full advantage of all of the wonderful resources that CLBR has to offer in applying to medical school or into any healthcare career. Um, so with that said, uh, I want to. It's my honor to introduce John Bates, class of 1967. Uh, John had a long career in medicine as a pediatrician, and he was the CEO at the Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, for two decades, a position from which he retired in 2013. He's a dedicated volunteer to Reed, where he sits on the alumni board and serves on the Reed Career Alliance, also known as RCA. The RCA advocates for career assistance for all years of alumni, be it mid-career, retiring, changing careers, or just starting out. John, thank you so much for making today's event possible, and go ahead and take it away. Should unmute, probably, huh? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks to those of you who are practicing physicians of one kind and another for taking time to uh, participate. And, uh, and we look forward to giving those of you who are not yet practicing physicians a kind of an overview about what life is like during the training phase of, of your career, uh, starting with medical school and on through residency and, uh, and fellowship training. So we'll try to give you that, that sort of view and as our primary focus and, and probably leave the question about how do you get into medical school more in the hands of the Center for Life Beyond Reed. But uh, happy to talk about it as much as, uh, as we may need to today. Uh, <clears throat> I think what I'd like to do then is go ahead and invite the uh, other panelists. You've got my bio, I think, somewhere that's being posted um, and you've heard about it already from uh, Amy. So why don't we go ahead and invite the uh, the other panelists to introduce themselves, and I'll take you in the order I have on the agenda here. Uh, so Ali, you're first up, if you wouldn't mind. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Ali Zell, class of 2016. Um, I'm currently a fourth year medical student at OHSU. Um, I'm applying into emergency medicine, um, so hopefully I'll match and start that in July. Um, I, let's see, after I graduated from Reed, I went down to Eugene, I got, I graduated, I got a degree in biology, went down to Eugene to work for Whiteboard Clinic in their um, health, FQHC, their little uh, community health clinic there, as well as their crisis center. Um, I wasn't so sure if I wanted to go to medical school until after I was there and realized that I, I love working with people, like humans are super weird, they do all sorts of wacky things, um, but I, I did miss that like really rigorous like scientific aspect that biology had and that STEM had. 
Um, so I felt like medical school was a really good way to wed those two things together. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, you're next up, if you would go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is Thomas Fong. Uh, I am proud to be Holly's classmate. Also at OHSU, fourth year medical student. I'm applying to anesthesiology. Uh, graduated from Reed in 2018, degree in biochemistry. Uh, yeah, actually a Portland local, went to Reed. And then uh, the while there, I realized that, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm learning and what medicine has to offer really goes well together. It's a very much hands-on um, aspect of medicine is taking the, the basic knowledge of science and applying it. And so, yeah, I applied to med school and uh, got in and kind of just <laughs> went for it right after Reed. And here I am almost done with med school. So. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, Frederica Keating, would you go next, please? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Frederica Keating. Uh, I graduated from Reed in 1985. I was an international um, student and I actually didn't get my diploma until something like 1991 because I was missing, among other things, three quarters of physical education. Don't do it. Don't do that. Um, uh, but anyway, I went to medical school in Germany, which is where I was from. And, um, uh, and then um, uh, what really brought me to medical school actually um, I had thought about going to medical school earlier, but then when I was at Reed, I took a little detour because I fell in love with physics. And um, so I started actually medical school and physics graduate school at the same time back in Germany. And then I decided to go into medicine. Um, ultimately, the thing that keeps me engaged in medicine is um, the you know really trite old saying of I like to help people. And that's really what it comes down to for me. I do like to help people. Plus I like an intellectual challenge. And this is just the perfect combination of those two, um, two qualities. I'm currently a professor of uh, medicine and attending in cardiology at the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, I'm also the director of the fellowship program up here and I direct uh, nuclear cardiology and stress imaging. Thank you very much. Uh Emily, and how about for you? Hi there, I'm Emily Lean. Um, I'm currently an intern in pediatrics at UC Davis, so in a residency program. Um, at Reed, I was an interdisciplinary biopsych major and I graduated in 2015. Um, in terms of kind of what led me to medicine, I um, took two years off kind of my gap years. Um, and was a primate researcher at the um, Primate Research Center here in um, Beaverton. Um, and I realized that I liked the care parts of that a lot more than I liked the bench, you know, science parts of it. So ended up deciding to apply to medical school and now here I am. Very good, thank you. And uh, Duncan, last but not least. Hey, I'm Duncan Ramsey, 04. I'm an orthopedic oncologist. It's a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. Uh, I major in math, wrote a thesis on triangles, kind of, and then went into mathematics, um, went to grad school, became an adjunct professor, and kind of like Emily thought, uh, realized um, I, I, I should be doing something else and went into med school. Um, I did residency in orthopedics at OHSU and my oncology fellowship uh, in Boston at Harvard. And now I'm in South Texas at University of Texas starting a, a new practice here. So um, I deal with orthopedic things like broken bones, trauma, hip replacements, basically turning humans into Wolverine. And then as an oncologist, uh, I treat people with uh, bone and soft tissue tumors that need resection, um, sometimes reconstructions. Uh, Folks with like breast cancer that have metastatic disease where it goes to their bones might need an orthopedic surgeon like me. Um, and that's, that's basically what I do. It's my, my life here, so. Well, Duncan, as long as you have the floor, we're looking at the very first question, which is what is the admissions committee looking for in their applicants? Uh, and maybe you could lead us off on that question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, like, like Amy said, there's a lot of resources um, through CLBR for a lot of the nitty gritty of this. Um, I know that a lot of readies uh, don't go to med school right out of read, which I think for the record is an awesome thing. It's a good idea. Um, but it also means you're kind of alone and more alone in the world. 
And I would recommend a couple things. Um, you know, admissions committees want to know that you know what you're getting into. Um, make sure that you have some good experience in the medical field, whether, you know, things like scribing or shadowing a lot of people do. I personally did all my experience was in like harm reduction and needle exchanges and public health, things like that. So um, especially if you're non-traditional, take what experience you have and really make it work for you and make it a, a, a positive instead of, instead of a negative. Um, and, but at, you know, at the end of the day, you, you might have a unique story, but you need to also remember to kill the MCAT so they bother reading your story. So, um, and always to talk to as many people as you can, as many physicians as you can. Very good. Um, Frederica, how about your view? Yeah, I, I was fortunate not to have to apply to medical school in the United States, because again, I was from Germany, but I'm married to another Reedy who went to medical school here in the States. And I very much remember him taking the MCATs um, in Munich, where we were living at the time on an army base. So yes, the uh, numbers are important, um, you know, especially coming from Reed, there's a certain amount of great inflation, uh, great deflation going on, as you know. So um, that may handicap you. Um, it will not handicap you in programs that know about READ. So it's, it's worth taking a look, a look at um, um, what you think they know or do not know about READ. Um, so if you don't, you know, if you don't have a, a 4.0 GPA, then um, it helps to, to have strong MCATs. And those, those, those things are, are not gonna make you a better or worse doctor. But um, medical schools um, will um, look for any kind of objective or semi-numerical parameter that they can use to filter your application. So it remains an important um, element. On the other hand, what I know our medical school looks for is they look for people that um, that look to be good um, teammates. You know that can work collaboratively, and um, that um, that they think can um, you know. You know, our program up here at UVM is is somewhat primary care oriented in medical school, and so they they look for people that um, that are interested in pro providing value to the community, and um, so humanistic interests and um, just being being good teammates and being collaborative are important as well. Okay, very good, uh, Tom. What would you add to all of that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I agree with everything that's been said, um, especially with the teamwork aspect. I think when medical school, like they're, they're not just ad admitting individual, they're trying to build an entire class and they want the people who they put in the class to get along with each other. Um, so, you know, like coming from Reed, like it, it, it's like you sometimes, you know, we're, we can kind of not work so well with each other or, or not communicate so well. So that's like something I have to work on a lot. Um, um, it's just lear really learning the communication skill and the teamwork and, um, you know, having that shown in your application some way, somehow, right. And, um, uh, like doing things that involve working with other people, uh, collaboratively, um, and, and talking about it will, will kind of help show that yes, you are a team player and, you know, yes, you can get along with, you know, the other hundred or so members of your class for the first two years, at least. Thank you. Um, Ali, what is your view on all of this? Um, I think continuing on this teamwork thing a little bit, um, it's another argument for taking time off between undergrad and medical school. I feel like medical school, it's kind of, it, it even becomes kind of more of a double learning curve if you've only really had like college experience um, and no workplace experience. A lot of our clinical rotations are only like a month long. You only know the people on your team for a few days. Um, it's much more difficult to kind of like understand teamwork dynamics and workplace dynamics and, and get some pretty strong community communication skills that can give you like a leg up getting into it. Um, that being said, I think I, I was on a, a panel my first year at OHSU um, and I told the group of readies that I got a C minus in OCHEM and I still got into medical school. And I was looking right at someone in the audience and, and she just looked at me like, like <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> so um, I had a really high MCAT, which is great, but I got a C minus in OCHEM and I still got into medical school. So I think if anyone is like, oh my gosh, like these numbers don't look great. It's, it's about your narrative, it's about your whole story. Like don't let that be an artificial barrier to your application. Um, just like absolutely still, still go for it. Um, that's not gonna keep you out of it. 
Or, or, uh, Emily. Yeah, I would echo what Ollie was saying for sure, which is that I don't think any one number or grade is going to necessarily be determinative of whether or not you get in. But I would say that I think the people who have very little insight into why anybody gets in are the people who got in, because in some ways we think because we got in, they're looking for us. Um, but in some cases, um, they're also looking for other people, right? And those are the people who, um, you know, kind of as Tom was saying, they're looking for an entire class and everybody is different. So it is very difficult to say. And I can say they're looking for someone like me because I got in, but maybe, maybe not in a certain year. So it's very hard to say. <clears throat> I might chime in on my own account here. Ollie, I'll match your story. I flunked freshman biology at Reed because I refused to learn the names of all the flatworms. And they said, learn them or flunk. And so I chose flunk and I got in. So it can, it can certainly happen. Uh, medical schools basically are looking for people who are likely to graduate. They really don't want to take chances on people that they think are, are not promising in terms of graduating. A half, a half trained physician or a, a partially trained individual is not a good thing to have out in our culture. The other thing they're looking for is somebody who will reflect well on the school. And that could be in terms of being a, a you know, collegial type behavior person, uh, high humanistic values, uh, Nobel prizes, whatever it might be, but they're looking for something that will be, will be good for the school in the long run um, to get there. I would mention for the, for the folks who are still in the course of applying, that it turns out that the upper 20 or 30 percent of any medical school is pretty much indistinguishable from any other medical school. The big difference comes at the bottom third, because the bottom third of Harvard is still very strong, but the bottom of a third of some schools is pretty pretty much weaker. So if you get to a, any school at all and stay in the upper portion of it, you'll you'll get a good a good training. Let's um, let's go on then to another one, and that is the uh, the question about culture shock when you went from Reed to medical school. And uh, Ali, you're the starting person on this one. Can you uh, comment about that? Yeah, I definitely experienced quite a bit of culture shock, um, both like from Reed to medical school, as well as from Whitebird, which is like a collective non-hierarchical um, workplace to medical school. Um, I think the thing is that a lot of doctors think that because they know medicine, they also know how to teach medicine, which is not inherently true, unfortunately, in all cases. Um, and then it's you also lack a lot of the kind of self-awareness of like having a unified like pedagogy and like what they're teaching and why they're teaching it and how they're teaching it. Um, and, and there's not really a good like construction around that, that I felt like was, that I really took for granted at Reed. Um, I also think like learning for the sake of learning is not something you're able to do in medical school. I definitely went in with the idea of like, oh, I don't need to like study specifically for the boards. Like I'm interested in everything. Um, but in medicine, we have this, this saying high yield that if something is high yield, it means it's worth it to know because half the game is knowing what you don't need to know. Otherwise it's impossible. Like you don't spend enough time with your loved ones if you try to just learn everything. And, and the, the game be, becomes like, learning what's important and like making sure you know that super well. Thank you. Uh, Emily, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I would say um, in a similar way to Ollie, I did experience a little bit of a change in terms of having to learn things for a test is very different than it is at Reed. At Reed, I never really felt like I was studying for a test. Um, but I would say that there were some things about my education at Reed specifically that I think made me stand out and be better prepared in class than some of my peers. For example, um, they drilled it into us in HUM 110 that you had to participate. So I always participate in medical school classes even when it's weird. Uh, so we're in a big lecture hall sometimes and the lecturer will be asking questions and it'll seem like a rhetorical question. And I'll answer anyway, just because I'm very used to that. And it did kind of, um, I think, make me stand out and seem like I actually, you know, was trying and then cared about the lecture, which sometimes when you are focusing on a test all the time, the professors can get kind of burned out on the students not seeming like 
they care about a particular research interest that's being lectured on. I might jump in here and just say that when I went to medical school, the, the faculty uh, taught that the liver was a third of the body weight. And that was the answer on the question. For those of you who don't know, the liver is not one third of the body weight. But that was the answer I had to give and I did not give it and I got marked down for it. So the idea, the, 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 the enculturation that's trying to go on is to, is to, is to bring you into line with what is the, uh, uh, if you will, the party line if, about a lot of different issues in medicine, some of which are scientifically founded and some of which are traditionally founded and everywhere in between. So that certainly was a unpleasant shock for me coming from the read environment to the setting in which I had to agree with what I knew was wrong uh, to get it done. Anybody? I would also very quickly just add that it won't be as much, I think, of a culture shock for people who were at read and who have experienced difficult classes and even failure sometimes and poor grades as it will be for a lot of your peers who are used to getting like straight A's to get into medical school. I did not have that kind of culture shock. When I failed my first anatomy final, I was like, well, I've done that before. I, this is not going to you know, blow my self-concept out of the water. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Tom, Duncan? I have a I have a comment. I, I work with medical students and at this point most of the people on this call may be starting to second guess their choice of or their interest in medical school. <laughs> um, and uh, it's first of all, you're hearing from various generations here. Um, I, I still work with medical I, I work with medical students every day and I am most thrilled by the ones who um, you know who, you know, question my decisions and question my answers and question my judgments. And I think that's not only because, you know, I, I went through that same kind of education that you guys did at Reed. It's also, you know, I'm not the only one there. There, there there's plenty of people that are smart there and that are, that are going to be your attendings and that are going to be able to engage with you in an, on an intellectual basis. So it's not really a desert when it comes to critical thinking. There are aspects of it that don't lend themselves to critical thinking as well. If you have to learn every single artery, every single muscle, every single nerve and plexus in the, in the human body, which you will have to, then yes, there, it's just a lot of rote learning and you're going to have to cram that somewhere into your hard drive. And that too, you have probably learned at read. So, um, so there, is some, 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 there are some cases where you just have to kind of reserve your uh, uh, judgment and 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 just you know put stuff in your hard drive but there's also a lot of um, room for you know creative dis discussions creative exchanges uh, research that you can do people that you're going to meet that are interesting so it's not all as dire as that I, don't, I wouldn't say I hope not anyway I, I would agree with that I um, I thought that coming from Reed was overall a net positive very much I think that uh, yeah you have to there's a lot of memorization but um, having a desire to know the reasons for things what and be able to think critically was um, gave a very strong firm foundation for everything else um, so I, I I thought it was great and I was also the only one in the lecture hall of 200 people that knew, what Galileo's uh, quote, Epur si mueve, meant, um, which earned me a lot of points with, uh, from my Latin attending, so. <laughs> I do think that the, uh, the second two years of medical school, when you're out in the clinical arena, typically much more, uh, is where the read background really can shine. It gives you a chance to, to really think about stuff. And there's a lot of things that go on in the clinical world that are not um, not always rooted in, in deep thought. And the more we can do for it, the better it gets. And, uh, and so I, the, the, it makes the first two years more bearable knowing the second two are coming, at least to the extent that's still flopped that way. Let's go on to a different question. This one uh, talks about specializing and fellowships and it asks what traits are compatible with certain specialties? And uh, Frederica, you were first on the list on that one. Would you like to comment? Yeah, let's uh, let, let me just start off by saying that um, I cannot answer that question because outside of um, physical uh, impediments like having poor um, 
um, you know, deep vision like I do, there's really nothing that will tell you right off the bat what you what you're going to be good at and what you're going to be drawn to. So uh, I remember being in a in a third year elective um, for neurosurgery, and um, um, I, I I only really see out of one eye, so I don't really have a lot of three dimensional vision. So I was trying to. They were asking me during surgery to cut the 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 suture, cut cut the thread, and I was cutting in the front and I was cutting in the back, and I I was not I was not you know cutting the thread where I was supposed to. And the and the surgeon turned to me and said have you considered doing something other than surgery? And I said, yeah, certainly. So I, and I always knew I wasn't going to be a good surgeon. I was not very good with my hands. I was not good at sewing, but beyond those like clear aptitude things, anything can grab you. There's no stereotypes that you have to listen to. If anybody tells you that because of your um, height, because of your gender, because of anything else, you can't be something, um, you know well enough not to listen to that. Um, I think that these kinds of things develop as you as you go through medical school. And the fun of going through medical school is really being grabbed by this, that, and the other. And then also at the same time, figuring out whether you can, you know, at one point I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. And then I learned that I really had a difficult time dealing with, you know, seriously sick children. Um, you know, I, I had, I, I just had a hard time with it. I, I took it home and I, you know, it, you know, I had an easier time dealing with old people who were sick than with really young people that were sick. So, so those are, those are kinds of things that you have to find out about yourself along the way. Nothing that you really need to think about at this point is what I would say. Uh, Duncan, you want to uh, comment it from your viewpoint? You have an interesting background on all of this. Yeah, I would uh, have a couple of things, I think. First off, um, like Dr. Keating said, don't take don't keep the stereotypes. You don't have to be a six foot tall jock to be an orthopedist, but um, you know, do do recognize that uh, whether or not you're going to love or hate uh, a profession where you have to like get on a bed and use your whole body to reduce hips and stuff. Um, I think a lot of times you're going to want you're going to spend like two days on a rotation and know whether it's for you. It's like sorting hat style. Um, everybody knows whether they're a surgeon or a medical um, physician very early in med school. Um, so just be honest with yourself and uh, experience everything. Do as many rotations with as many people as you can, um, and uh, you'll you'll figure it out. Um, and then when you choose that one, you again you don't have to be a uh, stereotypical person. Um, I went into ortho, but with my math background, I really marketed myself as you know, in residency, you know, I can be a uh, kind of a backbone of a research department here. I can really be that guy for you and that resource. And, and they really like that. And I ended up being that. So just, you know, make, make yourself a place wherever you want to go. Very good. Well, now, Ali, you're coming up on that decision, I suppose, or that opportunity. What's your thinking? Yeah, I definitely came into medical school thinking I, well, it, there's kind of a phrase like find your people, which is a little bit vague. Um, but I came in thinking I want to do family medicine. I was like, that's where my experience was. That's where kind of the like, like crunchy hippies are. <laughs> um, that feels like my people. Um, and then I actually did a family medicine rotation and I liked it, but was, I'm just too like ADHD for clinic. I was in Klamath Falls. Um, so I had a few days where I walked across the street and did a few shifts in the ED. And I was like, oh, like this, this is where I need to be. Like, I think I, I love making really fast decisions. I feel like there's something about emergency physicians that it feels easy for me to be on the same page about what our priorities are, about like how people communicate. Um, it's just something that really intuitively clicked for me. And I think luckily in medical school, it's like expected and encouraged that a lot of people don't know what they wanna do coming in. And there's plenty of opportunity to be able to go and rotate around and, and find what, what scratches that itch for you. Like where, what sparks joy, even something you might not have ever heard. Like I have a friend who decided to apply neurosurgery at like the final hour because she did like two weeks of that on her very last core rotation on neurology. And she was like, shoot, like, I don't think I could ever do anything else with my life. Like I have to do this. Um, 
So yeah, there's plenty of opportunity to figure out where your people are. And how about Emily? You, you've made your decision, I guess, at this point. Uh, how, how did you come to it? I did make my decision. Um, similarly to kind of um, what Ollie had described and also um, what Dr. Snyder wrote in the chat, I think you fall in love. And for me, I also thought I wanted to do family medicine. I also was doing rural family medicine and did it for three months. I thought it was fine. And then um, my first week back in Portland, um, I was on pediatrics and I remember I had a very difficult conversation with the parents of a newborn and it, they kept me until like eight o'clock. I was supposed to get out at six. And I remember thinking, I'm okay with that. I would stay later if I had to. And I think when that happens and you think I would stay later if I, it, you know, that's fine. Uh, that's a reason to listen. And that's a reason to go into that kind of thing because that means it's your passion and not just your job. We, when I was uh, on the admissions committee uh, for the university that I was a student at, we, as the candidates would come through, we would we would try to characterize each candidate, the, the sort of a, the the features of them that really stood out. We we identified three words for each candidate and kept track of them, and it was remarkable that the the words were often surprisingly close to the stereotypes, which of course is how you get stereotypes. But if you have somebody who is uh, a black and white thinker and who uh, is uh, interested in moving along and getting things done and so on, they tend to be surgical types. And, uh, and we would get little tiny women who wouldn't meet that criteria and great big jocks. And so it was fun to see the different range. We then went back five years later and found out what training program they entered into. And it turned out we were about 90% accurate in terms of the, the characteristic personality issues in terms of where you would go. There is a, I think that's why a certain times people will go in and the magic happens because you have the, the personality style that is, finds a, a welcome home with the other folks of a similar nature. Uh, maybe wrong, but certainly was the experience we had at that point. Um, no, way to, no way to know whether or not that would be true for everybody or for you. Let's go ahead then. Uh, we have another question here about surviving medical training, which I think is a, is a pretty interesting question. Because medical training, in this case, we don't just mean medical school, we also mean through uh, residency and fellowships. And uh, these are, these are uh, challenging times, not necessarily intellectually challenging in every case, but it can be challenging in other regards. I think the, the uh, new work hour restrictions uh, means that the, the physical challenging that used to be true has been eased up quite a bit so that it's much more livable uh, for training. By the same token, it's clear that the uh, extension of, I mean, the uh, development of work hours and limits on those means that some of the training programs are starting to find themselves stretched out because you can't get as much training in, in a part-time two years as you could in an intensive two years. So they have to make it into a three year uh, to bridge that, that gap. All of which has its impact on the individuals going through it. Let's talk about relationships for openers. Uh, Tom, how did medical school work in your world? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, it's a huge commitment, both in you know, time and energy. And, and even from the beginning, you expect for the first two years of medical school is studying essentially full time. And in the second two years is more clinical. And even during this first two years, you know, there's a lot of studying to do. But if you're intentional about your time, then you can budget out like, okay, I've studied five days this week. I can afford to take a day off and not fail my exam. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, doing that very precious one day that you take off or, or so many hours you decide to take off, then you, you kind of get good at planning to do something with it beyond that. Well, I don't have anything to do. I'm just going to sit here and, you know, stare at the TV. Um, so then, then, and, but some people do that, that's their way of, uh, you know, um, releasing the pressure valve and, and, and for me, you know, I choose to spend that time with my family. Uh, but you know, you, you are, you'll be committing, you, you, you will start to realize that, you know, for every time, you know, you give to the school that you're taking that time away from doing something else that you want, but, you know, you try to balance it out at the end. And I think it's just take some thought and careful planning. <clears throat> Uh, Frederico, what is your uh, sense about how it affects uh, relationships? 
So I, I mentioned that my my husband is um, a physician as well, or maybe I did. He's a Reedy as well. We met at Reed. So he went to medical school in the States. I went to medical school in Germany. So the first thing that can happen to you is long distance relationships. And that's kind of baked into the system, um, not just in our case, but in general, because there's a lot of steps along the way where you may be matched into a program that is halfway across the country, for example. So there's a lot of geographic uncertainty that comes with being in training. Uh, that's one thing, and that's something to consider ahead of time, especially when you choose the programs that you apply to. So being kind of conscious of that and conscious of your, you know, what your partner's um, um, uh, priorities um, uh, may be in that is 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 very important. As far as the day to day taking a toll on your relationships in medical school, yes, it's a very difficult time. But you know what, you know, you've all learned how to work hard and and study late and and be up half the night and then go on the next morning during your time at Reed. I I think that anybody who's gone gone through Reed is probably pretty well prepared for that level of intensity. So, you know, you got to you got to go in there knowing that you already know how to how to do, how to work hard and um you know and then finally what I what just came to my mind was when you were talking about um, how work hours, work hour regulations have changed things, that's true, but other things have come up. Um, for example, being pregnant during internship can be a ride. I can tell you from uh, my own experience, I became pregnant during July of my internship years. So I had the privilege of being pregnant throughout my entire internship, pretty much. Um, and that could be interesting. Um, and it's totally possible if you're lucky. Uh, so, so some of this is luck as well. I think that um, we're all getting a little bit better at negotiating and uh, around um, um, students and residents who are in difficult positions, either with their health or with pregnancy or with their mental health. I think these things are changing and they're getting better and people are a little more tuned into that. And you're not, um, you know, you you hopefully will, will face a more humane um, uh, system than than what we faced, uh, what we faced back in the the 80s and early 90s. I, th I think too sometimes there's a reluctance to come forward and seek out help in in various situations, uh, and lest it somehow mark you as being a, a wimp or not up to it or some such thing. And I, I think anything we can do to discourage that thinking you know, would be a, would be good to do. Ali, how about you? And there's a question about relationships and medical school. Yeah, um, I just wanted to be specific that the work hour limit in residency means that the work limit is now 80 hours, um, which I think is something like now is like, oh yeah, 80 hours a week and before medical school be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's still extremely intense. Um, I, I think I definitely, it was very important for me in medical school that I went to OAS and I have a lot of community in Eugene. I think having community nearby was really crucial for me. Um, I have kind of like my like home away from home down there. Um, it's really important to like maintain those relationships. I also think too it's it's really important and medical school really helps you focus on like what you actually want in your life and I just naturally stopped using social media entirely when I went to medical school. Um, because I didn't feel high yield. Like I'd much rather spend the, the precious free time that I did have with my loved ones. Um, my partner and I are talking a lot about residency next year and so much depends on where I match. Um, luckily they're a, a wilderness backpacking guide. So their job isn't wed to a physical location. They, they go to, they travel to Wyoming or to Utah for whichever, whatever they're like registered to teach um, for a semester. But I also too, like, I'm not so sure if they exactly understand like what intern year is, like the demands of that are actually going to be. And I am a little trepidatious going into that um, for what's going to happen. Um, I, there is a reason why medical professionals end up marrying each other. And part of it is that the, just the actual literal demands on your time. Um, but I also think too, medicine can be like pretty isolative and it can be difficult to communicate like the structures that are happening and like some of the things you see and, and 
some of the ways that like medicine operates when you're really in the thick of it. Um, yeah, it's 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 something that's totally doable, um, and something that takes some intention and care and can have some difficult points, just like any relationship. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Emily, uh, how about yourself? You've been through an internship as well. I am in the middle of my intern year, so I know a little bit oh, of the, oh, sorry, yeah. okay. the workload that Ali is talking about. And I will say, while it does sound terrible to work 80 hours a week, and I have broken duty hours and worked more than 80 hours a week a couple of times, most of the time I am not breaking duty hours. And most of the time I'm not even getting all that close to 80 hours a week. It's closer to like 60 or 70, um, which is still more than like the average person works. <laughs> I don't mean to make it sound like it's wonderful in that. Um, in terms of my um, relationship side of things, um, I got married prior to medical school, um, actually just a couple of months prior to medical school. I um, decided to become pregnant um, my fourth year of medical school. So the year that Ollie and Thomas are in now. Um, I had a very difficult pregnancy and I really benefited from um, virtual interviews in that year. I benefited from COVID in a way because I didn't have to try and find something that would fit me when I was immensely pregnant, which is lucky. Um, and I had a baby um, right after I graduated, but before residency. Um, so in my busiest year of training intern year, um, I, have a, I had a newborn basically. It is difficult, um, but what I would say is that when I have time, I use it on my family. And when I don't have time, I end up using it on work. Um, and I have not really felt like I have had to choose all that often. I have actually felt like I've been able to meet my research interests, my advocacy interests, all of my family, you know, um, time that I want to have and also still be able to succeed at work. I'm not sure how overall common that is, but I feel like with the support from my husband, I'm really able to make sure this all works well. I'm, I'm hopeful that the uh, work hours and some of the other changes that Dr. Keating was talking about earlier uh, have, have contributed to making it, making it possible for you to say those things. So that's uh, certainly encouraging. Thank you. There is, of course, the issue of financing. Um, medical training turns out to be very expensive these days. Um, in my past life as a, as a hospital director, we would get, we try to recruit physicians who would be carrying heavy amounts of debt as they, as they incurred during training one, at one or another level, sometimes during residency, sometimes during medical school, sometimes during fellowship. And they would often be looking for financial assistance to cope with that load of debt. Um, and that, that can be quite a challenge and it can be quite a challenge to relationships as well if the money gets terribly tight. Um, on that, with that introduction, Tom, you want to make any comments about it or, or perhaps you're independently wealthy? I, I wish that was the case. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's certainly an important consideration, especially when choosing medical school. Like some medical school are like more expensive than another. And if you were to have the choice of, you know, uh, putting the whole calculation together and, 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 and coming out, you know, with different amount of loans and that has to take into consideration. Um, I think it's hard to fully appreciate it as a medical student because you're still going through it. So I think I'll, I'll leave the rest to Dr. Ramsey, who's, you know, been through things and is now in the process of, you know, starting work and how he thinks about these things. All right, go ahead, Dr. Um, you know, I, I think a the way that med school is funded is pretty opaque to a lot of people when, when we start medical school. Um, luckily, I think a lot of schools do have some sort of um, financial savvy lectures actually at the beginning. I know, I know mine did, which was helpful. Um, but I'll tell you, I attended a public school uh, at UT. Tuition was under 20 grand. Uh, OHSU is about four times that. It's uh, another public school with the most expensive in the country. Um, uh, it was at Harvard last year, which is also expensive, but not that bad. Um, and honestly, you're going to get an excellent education anywhere. Um, and though I don't think money should be at the very top of your rubric, or maybe even in the top five, 
I can tell you that I not having a lot of debt is very liberating. Um, I have, you know, a couple of friends that have almost half a million dollars in debt and they honestly, they don't have a choice, but to have gone into something procedural based, uh, unless they want that hanging around their neck for many, many, many years. And there's an emotional, um, advantage, I think, to, to not having that. So, um, just, you know, again, not at the top, but uh, educate yourself on how this stuff works because most of us had no idea before we got in there. If you think about it, the, just to follow up on your, on your comments, if, you, if you're in training for a program that may require you to train as internship, fellowship, maybe even uh, subspecialty fellowship beyond that, you could be looking at not getting out into the world to earn money until you're about 35. And if you come, arrive at 35 and you're a half a million dollars in debt, your wife has been skimping along for a long time on, on marginal income from your training years and uh, is, needs a new car, they, it needs some basics uh, and so on. And if you're a proceduralist, you may not be able to do some of the procedures much past the age of 60 or 65. So you have a very narrow window to pay off a big debt, recoup a lot of background that you want, and just about the time you're digging out, your kids are ready to go to college. So it's a, if you think about all of those considerations, uh, it, it's worth some careful thought as you come into it. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, let's see. The other, the other part of this question had to do with, with your own mental health and your own morale. And I think I'd be interested, Emily, you started to talk a little about that. Uh, are there other things that you've done or that you find helpful to keep your, uh, keep your mental stamina up? Um, yeah, so I would say for me, and I can really only speak for myself, what worked for me at Reed and what also worked for me in medical school and what is also working for me in internship was not having just one thing to kind of tie my overall thoughts of self-worth to. It can be very difficult if you're somebody who ties your self-worth to your grades and then you get bad grades because, well, then what are you going to do? You feel badly about yourself. So what I would end up doing is really telling myself like I am the things I do and I am my interests and those things include advocacy, those things include research interests, those things include my family. I am more than just any like one measure of myself. Um, and I think it helped me not panic too much when things got difficult. So, um, you know, when you are having trouble in anatomy lab, um, I would not really get too, you know, devastated by bad scores because I was busy running like a get out the vote campaign, or it was difficult for me to like panic about interviewing um, for residency too much because I was pregnant. It was difficult for me to, you know, worry all that much about, you know, breaking duty hours because I have research projects that I'm also trying to work on. So, um, I think having a lot more things than just school or just work to make yourself yourself is very important. Having your identity linked to more than just one metric is, I think, crucial. But, uh, you know, your mileage may vary with that advice. That's me. I tend to overcommit and then feel better about it. Judging from the nodding heads I see, I think a lot of people agree with you about, uh, about that point. Good stuff. Um, Ali, how about you? Yeah, definitely. Part of my goal after graduating Reed and moving to Eugene um, was to, I had a few goals. One was to basically come out as transgender, um, get to come out to my family as that, um, to start hormonally trans transitioning, and also to get my mental health on lockdown before pursuing any sort of graduate school education. Um, and I think like, being able to take that time and like go through my process and really try to build myself a, a solid base from which to grow the rest of my career, but more importantly, kind of the rest of my life and the rest of my adulthood, um, I think was like very crucial and very vital for my like continued success in medical school. Um, I think medical school is like not something to kind of go into compulsively um, and it's good to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row before entering it because it is 
difficult, like we've been saying. Um, and it's, it's also difficult to have a mental illness um, and be in medicine because there's, for, for a bunch of different reasons, but there is a weird dichotomy between like a physician and a patient and doctors, even just statistically have a difficult time kind of dealing with our own mental illnesses, our own mental health. Um, so yeah, that was, that was my approach to it. And so far so good. Um, very good. John, can I, I want to add one thing to that. Um, not as much for medical school, but when you are applying and interviewing for residency, um, you know, finding out how supportive your colleagues are, what kind of the feel that residency is, is very, very important. Um, it's okay to really delve into that when you're interviewing, find out what their parental leave policies are for that matter. You know, are, you know, whether you're a, a woman or a man, if you think you might be having a kid, find out whether you think you're going to, you know, they're going to make you a black sheep or whether they're going to be supportive of you. Um, I, I definitely went uh, interviewed at one place and for that exact reason, their support like walked out saying, I will never go there. So um, really try to choose the people that you're going to be around. Um, they're going to be your, your closest people. And you have, I think, I think we have a lot more um, kind of control over that than uh, people in medicine did earlier on in years past. It's a very good thing to do oftentimes to speak with somebody who's in the program currently and get their view on it. And another tactic that's not bad is to simply sit in the cafeteria of whichever organization you're thinking about and just listen. You'll learn an awful lot <laughs> that you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, but that would help you make a good choice. All right. <clears throat> At this point, I think we are, we're done with the formal question portion of our program tonight. Um, or this evening. Uh, <clears throat> we are now open for questions from the floor, and we'd be glad to have anybody bring up your question. We'll direct it if it needs directing, or if you have a particular panel member you'd like to hear from, uh, address that panel member. We'll go from there. Um, I feel like we touched on this a little bit, but I want to bring it up because it was one of the most popular questions in our registration form was, how did Reed prepare you for your journey and for uh, your experience being a physician or training to be a physician? Okay, we can work on that one while uh, folks think of any other questions they might want to ask. Who would like to tackle that one first? How did Reed prepare you for medical school? <laughs> I feel like we touched on it a little bit um, kind of at the beginning, but what I would say is kind of the overall academic rigor prepared me to learn a lot really quickly. Um, and I think it didn't prepare me for how like bad it would feel to have to learn so much so quickly, but it did prepare me for being able to like effectively apply that knowledge later on um, and to recall all of those things and to think that learning was important. So I think sometimes when you are cramming a bunch of facts into your head, you just get weary of it. But at Reed, I learned that I liked to learn and I would return back to that whenever I got tired. I would remember that it is awesome to know all of these veins. It is really cool to know all of these bones. You know, it is great that we can have these conversations about the structures that influence the delivery of medical care. This is cool. And it would make everything a lot better for me um, because if you do think about it as just cramming facts into your brain, you become a little bit down and blue after a while. I'd like to ask uh, Duncan and Frederica if they've ever stopped learning. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, you know, my, my career is much shorter at this point, but uh, I think that certainly it doesn't stop. If anything, it accelerates. Um, there's always more and more to read, uh, but it, it becomes more fun. You start out in med school having to, you know, learn this huge amount of, you know, and, and breadth of information. And then you finally, you, you know, you gradually kind of cone down to what you like. And so now I, you know, I'm reading every day more and more papers, but it's stuff that I absolutely love. Um, and it, it becomes more enjoyable and even less of a chore as it goes on. I hope that remains the case. <laughs> so I have, I have a very different perspective. So you got to understand, read for me was my gap year. 
Um, I came from a system where I would have gone from high school directly into medical school. And uh, I knew of the concept of college, and that's why I wanted to go to read at least for a year. That's how I got there originally, and then it turned into two years. And for me, this was the opportunity to branch out and spread out beyond the track, the track into medicine or the track through medicine. And so what 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 I've gained from Reed uh, is is not techniques of how to how to interrogate something critically. I kind of, you know, had that before that. And it was more about the other things outside of pre-med, say, like the, the fact that I fell in love with physics or the fact that I did philosophy while I was at Reed, things that just wouldn't have happened if I had gone straight to medical school. And that is what still sustains me at this point, these many decades later. And I see the same thing in my husband who was uh, uh, who went to read for five years, uh, did two theses, double major, and um, is still sustained by all those things that he does outside of medicine. So I think that what you're gonna come back to again and again is that you can apply the curiosity that brought you to read and the things that you learned while you were at read that weren't necessarily straight line, straight track to uh, your life, your life beyond read and your life beyond medicine. I think a lot of people come to read feeling like they're uh, at, at one end of the bell curve of normalness. They, they, they're, they're, they're solo players, they're oddballs, they're, they're on the margins in some ways of where they are when they get to read they suddenly find their colleagues there are other people like them and you're not alone in the world and i think that 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 experience uh stays with you even as you go back out into the rest of the world where you may not be mainstream but certainly uh, you know that there are others like you and it's okay to be interested it's okay to be curious it's okay to to drive on something it's okay to ask painful questions and i think at least for me, that was an important part of all of this. Others, anybody else then? Okay. I think, oh, sorry, I think Reed really teaches you how to write too, which is not to be underestimated in medicine. Yes, yes some of us learn better than others, I think. <laughs> Do we have questions from the floor? We wanna be sure, otherwise we'll go back to the questions that, that some of you sent in, if that's all right. Um, how about the grade deflation problem and the admission step? Uh, I'll give you an example of that one, for instance, from my own experience, and that is that I applied to a certain medical school and I went there and they gave me a very perfunctory interview and sent me on my way. And by the time I got home, the phone rang and it was the chairman of the Department of Biochemistry wanting me to come back and do an MD PhD because they had looked up Reed and decided that they had grossly underestimated my uh, GPA. And I decided I didn't want to go a place like that. So <laughs> it's it surely can happen. Anybody, anybody else? I think several of you have commented already about the deflation problem. Oh, here comes a whole set of questions coming in. Let's see which ones might be good. Uh, we're we have a question from Bella. Yeah. How do you prepare emotionally for the toll medicine can take on you? Well, I think we get Emily and, and Ollie both gave us some, some pretty good feedback on that point earlier, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you, you want to add to that? I can add to that for sure. Um, so in terms of actually preparing, um, I think it is very important to know what you're getting into when you're applying. And I think, you know, I, I think this is probably the only career where a panel would be like, you know, buyer beware about this career, you know, like, oh, actually think about it and make sure you really want to do it um, because it is demanding. So I would say, actually knowing that there's like a spectrum of different ways that people practice actually speaking to um, different physicians and different types of physicians to understand what the lifestyle will be and that way when you're working towards it you realize that there is at some point you know maybe you don't like medical school but 
residency, that's where you're going to shine and then your career is going to take off or you are just waiting for this research opportunity when you're a fellow or something like that. So I would say just having a goal in mind and having something that you are looking forward to um, for when times are kind of dark and difficult. Here's a, here's a question I'd like to pose to the panelists and it says, is there anything you regret doing or not doing? In other words, was there anything you wish you were more prepared for before applying to medical school? God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I alluded to it multiple other times, but I wish like nothing else that I had ever taken an anatomy class before I started medical school because it just came at me so fast and so furious and you have to learn it very quickly and it is a high volume of things to learn. Um, and it was not really something that I had the opportunity to do at Reed. So that was very hard for me. Um, and it wasn't a way I had been tested before. Part of the ways you know they test you are uh, on human cadavers and a string is tied around whatever item they would like you to identify and you kind of peer in to a body cavity to examine it in order to figure out what it is. And that was very difficult for me and I wish I had had any experience ever with anatomy at all. Um, there's nothing I thought like that I missed, I felt like I missed out on by applying um, to medical school and by going to medical school. I feel like I have been very lucky and been able to address a lot of my research interests and a lot of my interests in advocacy at the same time as being a medical student and an intern. Thomas, do you have anything on your list of things you wish you had done differently? Uh, it's kind of hard for me to tell because I, I went straight in. <laughs> so maybe you get I, I would have taken a gap year if I could do it again, maybe two. <laughs> Uh, but now it's a little late for that. So I don't know. I think also at the same time, though, I think it felt right for me. Like, uh, I just like I just knew that like med school was a thing I wanted to do. So I, I went and I got in and it, it's feel pretty satisfying. Um, so I guess I will, I'll realize what I missed out later on in life, I guess. But right now I'm, I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Anybody else? Um, Frederica, Ollie, Duncan? You I, would, I would I would I would I would add. Um... Not, not something I would do differently, but something I would advise considering is um, um, something I did actually, is I had a job as a, as a, as a nurse or basically a nurse's, you know, in, in my situation back there, it was basically doing the job of a nurse. These days it would be more of a nurse's aide, I'm, 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 I'm sure. But just being in a, in a, a position that's closer to nursing than to being a physician, at least for a few weeks, at least for six weeks, or maybe for a year as a job that you do on the side, caregiving. Just that, that aspect of medicine was really, really valuable for me to have experienced before going to medical school. It helps you uh, learn a different aspect of medicine that you will not learn again during medicine. This, this really hands-on caregiving, how to make a bed when there's a patient in it. How to how to how to help them with their meals? Um, this really human stuff that you know you can get yourself removed from too quickly when you're when you're a, a medical student and a resident. So I would very very much recommend that. It also gives you a very different relationship to nurses later on because you will re, you will realize where they're coming from. You will realize why they are the the, 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 the thorns in your side and, and where they're coming from as patient advocates. So that is something I would highly recommend. Uh, being, being married to a nurse, I would go up one step further and say, uh, it's also in your best interest to learn how to be collegial with the nurses because they can make your life wonderful or they can make it a living hell. And uh, understanding their world is very valuable. As a medical student, we were required to do shifts as the nurses on units so that we learned about what life looked like from their viewpoint and their end of things. And it, it is different, absolutely. Good point. There's a, been a thing going in the chat about older people going to medical school or being accepted and, and questioning, is there a prejudice against the older candidate? And a couple of the answers come back that say, well, not always, <laughs> because there are some older candidates, but it sounds like maybe not as many as might be there. Anybody else want to comment who had already weighed in in the chat? 
Yeah, I, I know just statistically, um, it's much more common to have older um, people matriculate. Uh, you know, but the, I, I was one of them and we had a, um, several people in both my med school and residency that were at my age or some even older. So I think it's actually a little bit of experience is valued. You know, there is a certain point at which, you know, a med school, a public med school that, that's tasked with training doctors for a society, um, and that's part of their duty, has to kind of, you know, do the math and evaluate, you know, um, are we going to train this person to go into the workforce after 50? So, and, and, and for the applicants as well, that would be, that would be rough. You actually will occasionally find some older individual going back for training in a completely different discipline. I know of several who have gone back to go uh, through a psychiatry training program in their 50s, um, having realized that they needed a lot more experience and, and knowledge in that arena. And here's a question about advice if you're interested in doing that, if you're currently have a full time job and are unsure about internships and such that are paid. Um, Bella, can you, are you still here? Yeah. Uh, the getting into medical school, if you have a full-time job really depends, I think, on what kind of credentials you can bring to bear. I, I think the fact that you have a job won't, won't uh, affect it one way or the other, unless it's a, a medically or, or uh, healthcare related job of some kind. Internships in general don't pay particularly well, um, but they're certainly paying more better as time goes on. I, what's the current go rate for uh, internships these days? Emily. <laughs> so it actually depends a lot on um, where you are. So I think at OHSU, an intern makes um, like 56,000 a year. Um, it, at UCSF, they make more um, and there's like a cost of living um, adjustment. So they get like several thousand dollars uh, a year for housing costs. Um, so I am in Sacramento. I make um, 61 and some change thousand a year, um, which isn't like a ton, but I'm able to live on that. And it's a lot better than it was when I was a med student and had no income at all. So I feel very grateful. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, Thomas had a good suggestion in the chat for Bella and that is get in touch with some folks, uh, maybe on the panel and otherwise, who might be some help in your particular situation. I think uh, a number of us on the panel would be more than happy to have you uh, Get, be in touch. I'm for, I'm for one. You're welcome to do that. Um, and I think Dr. Keating, did I hear you volunteer? Oh, I yeah. At this at this point, I'd like to say that I'm always happy to um, be contacted by anybody on this call for any reason. You know, whether you just happen to be in Vermont or whether you want have some questions via email. The only thing that doesn't work for me is is phone, but I can text just fine. Just phone calls aren't aren't great for me because I never know where I'll be. But otherwise, contact me any anyway, anytime. I also want to say we are going to have a panelist at panel number two, which we'll talk about in a moment, who is an MD PhD who may have some insight. So you should try to attend that one. All right. Anything else that we need to touch on? Uh, one, one more, one more thing I wanted to say. First of all, I wanted to say about the timeline. Now, you know, this, you know, I, I see a lot of American medical students um, and residents being concerned about finally making it through training and starting, starting to work. And that's understandable if you have a considerable amount of debt. If you are in a situation where your debt is manageable or you can see the the horizon of it. Then I would say don't 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 worry about an extra year spent here or there. For example, an extra year spent doing a chief residency, or an extra uh, three four years spent doing a PhD, which will actually help you with your debt. Um, those those years, you know, in in the long run, will will be like little investments for you, and they'll come back manifold. Um, and the other thing I wanted to see is say is on the other end. 
you know, we're talking about this tunnel of medical school and residency. Once you're out of that tunnel, there's so much more flexibility. There's so many scenarios that you can explore and what you can do with your training. Um, you know, the world opens up to you and it really is a very rewarding, beautiful career. So, so I just wanted to point that out. I would echo that with an amen because we have a wide range of panelists coming up uh, who I think will give us a sampling of it, uh, and certainly by no means all of it. <clears throat> we, uh, we in fact may wind up having two or three subsequent panels talking about different dimensions of where you can go once you finish up with your training. We have a, uh, an individual in Croatia, for example, who's been very keen about some of the uh, public health and uh, um, uh, outreach kind of opportunities you have as a physician in foreign countries. So uh, we can look into that. Um, Amy just posted for you the information about the October 12th event. And uh, <clears throat> those of you who are interested in seeing what's at the, the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, to uh, follow up with Dr. Keating's example, uh, please do join us there for that. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. And uh, you have, I think, all of our emails and contacts. And uh, many of us are working and are not available very easily. But some of us are more available, so uh, kind of pick and choose wisely, if you would, please. Amy, what else do we need to do tonight? Um, well, I, we've got some time left. So if anybody has a question, you're just, this is your uh, last opportunity to ask it of these wonderful panelists. So um, this has been wonderful. Thank you all. And I, and I do want to thank you, Amy, for helping us get all of this organized, and Olga for stepping in to help out as uh, Amy's away at the moment. Um, how, many, how many of these uh, panels have you guys run? I think this is number five, specific to the uh, RCA career pathways. Um, we've run many other virtual events and panels, so I don't I don't even know what the count would be at this point. Olga's definitely got more on than I do. <laughs> but, but just so everybody knows, there have been panels on entrepreneurship. There have been panels on I think some of the law people have done panels. Yeah. And who else? Uh, let's see. Must be we somebody. Publishing. Uh, Reedy's in the world, uh, international Reedy's working internationally, uh, creative Reedy's, uh, Reedy's in the arts and performing arts. Olga, what else did we have? I think you covered all of them. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. And there's a, Entrepreneurs. a Reedy's in government is coming up in November. Yes, we're going to have a really great uh, group of panelists in November. Date to be determined, but we'll get the info out to everybody. Well, we just think that the readies in medical school are probably feeling more isolated and more lonesome than perhaps in other fields and other disciplines. And we wanted to be sure and at least create an opportunity to reach out and connect with folks and, uh, and uh, share experiences and maybe offer some guidance or at least some cautions in some cases and also some encouragement. Looks like Bella's got a question. Uh, have any of you interacted with international health? The degree to which I have done it uh, is not helpful. <laughs> I'm afraid. So many, many uh, universities and medical schools have a lot of global health programs right now. So wherever you go in your training, you're going to find opportunities. Um, I've, um, you know, touched on uh, a couple um, during my during my experiences, and one of them was uh, an experience in Uganda, and came away feeling more like a um, I don't know. It didn't end up feeling good because I was only there for a really short time. I think it takes a, a more sustained effort to not feel like a global tourist. So it's something if you if you want to invest in it, if you want to do um, uh, uh, international health, it's it's good to um, to really devote blocks of time to it or to devote. Actually, there's you know educational programs that you can do. Um, and real, you know, programs within certain universities, and to to really become a global health um, specialist. So there's a way to do this right, is what I'm saying. And just flying out to a country for a couple of weeks and doing this or that, um, I did not find to be the way that was right. Um, and um, uh, uh, 
But on the other hand, to put a positive spin on it, the one of the beauties of medicine is that you can do it anywhere. And that is actually one of the things that attracted me to medicine in the first place, that you know you'll you'll be able to 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 be valuable and of use anywhere you go. Yeah, just... the, the, the need and the demand for international uh, uh, health is enormous, and I don't think you'll have any trouble finding lots and lots of places that would be glad to, uh, to have some more recruits. I can talk a little bit about the opportunities that OHSU has specifically. Um, so I actually, my scholarly project initially was supposed to be um, studying um, respiratory diseases in Thailand. And I was all set up to go. And then it was, uh, let's see, March of 2020 and my trip got canceled. So that was a total bummer, but I was scheduled to have a month long rotation in Thailand at a partnership at Sri Raj University and Hospital in Bangkok. Um, it was a bummer that I didn't get to do it, but it would have been a great opportunity if I had. And then another thing that comes up fairly frequently um, is Dr. Rahel Nardos at OHSU um, is an Ethiopian born um, urogynecologist. And she like went back, started a whole clinic. Um, she does a lot of pelvic floor reconstruction surgeries and she is incredible. So if you are interested in anything like that, um, I would highly recommend, like in the link I put in, you can hear her talking about it. And it's um, just really helpful and very moving when you think about global health. We had another question come in from Mac. Uh, is it possible to get into med school if you are not a STEM major? Yes. Yeah, um, it's uh, programs more and more these days don't really have a degree requirement. They just have a, a, a certain requirement that you take a certain number of classes and credits before you can get in. I think some program actually doesn't require you to have college degree at all. Um, as long as you have done, you know, these classes and taken the MCAT, that is, you know, your prerequisite for admission. So you, you don't have to do a particular STEM degree, but, you know, you, you do need to take a certain number of classes, as I said, yeah. I see a lot of applicants come to my fellowship who, uh, you know, were political science majors in college or something. And then um, uh, they, a lot of them do a one year extra um, somewhere else. And it's called medical sciences, has any kinds of names. And it's, it, these are specific programs to just catch you up on the classes that you happen to not have taken during college. So there's specific programs for this to just do that so that you're ready you know, you got to take your OCHEM and whatever else requirements there are. Mm -hmm. Very good. I see it. Uh, you see in the chat several examples of uh, from various places that have uh, had unusual credentials coming in, but uh, obviously it went on through. I think we have, well, we now have more panelists than we have. Uh, audience and i think amy we don't have to go strictly speaking all the way to no absolutely okay. not i think it might be time to wind things down this this party is is yep yeah, it's time to wrap things up well um, i certainly want to say thank you to all the panelists you guys did all the work and uh we really appreciate your time and uh, uh investing in this way and that and then some of the comments that are coming through sounds like uh, a lot of people found it pretty helpful so thank you very much